Hello, everybody. It, it is Monday, May 16th. Can you believe May is like halfway over because I can't. And in two weeks, it'll be Memorial Day. Um, speaking of Memorial Day, we will not be here on Memorial Day. So enjoy the day off with your families and friends. A nice kickoff for the summer. Uh, today, we are having uh, Dr. Dwyer with us again shortly. And we are going to talk about using mindfulness I'm going to read it directly from, um, from the graphic I created. Using mindfulness to let go of stuff that is out of our control. I am really excited for this because if you guys are like me, you probably feel like there are a lot of things in your life over which you have no control and it can be very frustrating. Um, the only thing you have control over is you and mindfulness can help you to um, get a grasp on controlling yourself in a healthy way, because um, we know that holding emotion in is not healthy and lashing out at other people is neither kind, helpful, nor, nor is it the right thing to do. So um, yes, mindfulness to help us uh, let go of things out of our control. Uh, we wanna give a big shout out to the Bear River Health Department, the Davis County Health Department and the Central Utah Public Health Department because of the grants that they so generously have provided to us to make parent conversations possible. Um, we're going to start off today while we are waiting for Dr. Dwyer to join us, uh, kind of doing a check in from last week if anybody has something that they have done um, to practice mindful communication or mindful parenting or just mindfulness in general for self, uh, self help and self awareness and for a little bit of uh, a brain break. We would love for you to be able to share that with us now. Um, I'm going to think for a second about my mindfulness during the last week. You know what? I will, I'm not going to share mine. Um, Shirley, if you've got something, I will let you share. I'm going to share an experience that um, my sister shared with me. Um, she's had a bit of a, a struggle lately. And one of the only things that has made her feel better is practicing mindfulness. Now she uses an app, um, Headspace. I think she uses Headspace. And that you can get a free version of Headspace. And if you are a member of Blue Star Families, you can get um, the, I think the full access to it for free. Don't quote me on that, but I believe that is one of the benefits of being a Blue Star Family. Yes, you can. Okay, thank you. Um, so it's, uh, she. her mind has just been, you know, she's got some stress going on racing um, a lot lately and mindfulness has really helped her just kind of come back to herself and reminds herself that, Hey, everything's going to be okay. And she uses the guided meditation on the app. Now I have done a few guided meditations in yoga. Sometimes in a yoga class, our instructor will take us through a guided meditation and we can just concentrate on what she's saying and envision what she's saying. And I have to say that the one, the, the most Zen I ever got at the end of a yoga session, when I was lying um, totally flat on my back and was totally unaware of what was going on, there was nothing on my brain. I was extremely relaxed and, and didn't even pay attention to the fact that the yoga class had ended was during a guided meditation practice. So um, there's a plug for trying some guided meditation. If you, like me, try to get um, doing some mindfulness uh, for meditation, for relaxation, and your brain just runs away with, with lots of um, activity. So um, other than that, mindfulness is not just about meditation. It's being present. It's being mindful of what is going on, sometimes taking a step back and looking at um, what you're doing with fresh eyes, um, choose maybe, maybe choosing to react instead of choosing to act instead of react based on what is going on. Um, Melissa, Catherine, Shirley, anybody want to share any uh, benefits or any experiences from your mindfulness in the last week since we were last together? I can share well, something. Just... Oh, okay. go ahead. Catherine, go um, ahead. Um, so we did the, the sense it one or 
Can you sense it from the app, Use Chase app? Okay. And just kind of took the kids through looking for five things. And we were trying to do it in conjunction with our <laughs> weekly family meeting, family night. And so we took each one of those five senses or whatever, and we did yeah. it in between a segment of the family night because the kids were just completely crazy last Monday. I don't know what it was, but they were just- Well, there was a full moon. <laughs> that, that was probably it. <laughs> so we tried to do that. And honestly, some of the kids, it was- like they were into it and others weren't so much into it. Um, and then later on, we, as part of our family night, we were, we're trying to teach the kids how to use um, calming down methods like mindfulness or relaxation or um, yoga, things like that. So we did a, a little yoga and we let the kids pick which one they want to do each week. Um, it rotates through each kid. And they did a, a little um, yoga thing from Cosmic Kids. And honestly, that was a way better thing for them just at their age and their, where they're at than the senses mindfulness thing. So that was kind of interesting just kind of see the difference for them um, and just kind of trying to relax and understand I don't have control over how they're going to respond to different techniques, but trying to find which one matches their level currently. So that was, that was kind of eye-opening. That's nice. That's good. I'm glad you found something that works for your family and different things are going to work for different people. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah. And I've heard that Cosmic Kids is really good. So cool. Shirley, did you have something you wanted to share? Well, I was just going to say, so last week I had an unusual experience. Megan will laugh when I say this. So I was traveling and my travel partner goes to bed like at 9.07. <laughs> yeah, when she has to get up at three, she does. <laughs> and so, and she wanted lights off. She's not like my husband who lets me watch, you know, like have the TV on for company and work until all hours of the night. So I had to just like lay there in the dark. <laughs> and I tried some mindfulness since I didn't know what else to do there in the dark. And ironically, it put me to sleep. So <laughs> that, was, that was my mindfulness. Awesome. I thought, how am I going to get to sleep at 9.15 p.m. when I'm used to going to bed at midnight or one or two? I don't understand you night people. <laughs> I don't understand you, but, <laughs> but I enjoy traveling with you. And, and yeah, Thank that you. was my mindfulness experience is. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's, that's our biggest problem is I'm a morning person. And Shirley is not. <laughs> <laughs> I am a night owl. I like my nights when everyone else has gone to bed and I can actually work on my work. <laughs> so anyway, but that's yeah, it was, funny. um, it was an interesting experience. Well, cool. Yeah, put me to put me to sleep pretty quickly. So I'm not sure that's what it's supposed to do, but it worked. If, if that's what you needed, and that's what your traveling companion needed too, obviously. <laughs> yeah, she fell asleep really early last Wednesday. <laughs> oh. oh, anyway. Um, so any but Melissa, I see that you're still on here. If you if you don't have anything to share, that's okay. Um, we're gonna take a look at something on maybe do a little practice on the, something that's on the on the hunt. Um, let's see. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, let's see. Um, here, here's a good one. Um, and this this applies to a lot more than mindfulness, but the mindfulness comes in, I think, where you're you're gonna be noticing what's going on with your family members. This one is called switch it up. If you notice a family member is struggling with a task, that's part of where the mindfulness comes in, help them replace negative self-talk with a thought that allows them to separate themselves from the task at hand and persevere to find a solution. You might prompt them with the words, this is hard to do, but I can keep trying or ask for help. Um, and then you can also add, I'm, I'm throwing my own thing in here, the power of yet. So we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, in the hunt itself, the the evidence is to share a phrase you used this past week to help a family member to switch it up. So, um, recently I was uh, watching um, 
I was watching a Ned show. <laughs> and Ned is, um, Ned visits uh, schools around the country and does um, some mindfulness stuff and some um, encouraging things. And uh, you, you'll find more, uh, you'll learn more about, about Ned in the future. But You're talking about the mindset mastery stuff the, and the minds that having a growth mindset. Yes, I am. I am referring to that as well. And we do have uh, a parent conversation from last fall about the growth mindset. So um, Dr. Dwyer is on our way. So I will finish up quickly. Anyway, yes, we talked about the power of yet. I can't do that yet. So maybe that can be the new phrase that you use to help family members switch it up. So let's, Dr. Dwyer, your timing was like perfect. <laughs> Glad to hear. <laughs> yes. Okay. So we are going to turn the time over to you. I am totally excited to talk about using mindfulness to let go of things that are out of our control. So take it away. I'm going to, I'm going to get my notepad out. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, uh, good afternoon. Happy May. Hopefully it's warm where you guys are. We are nice and warm in um, Denver area, but going to drop into freezing, I think Friday. So <laughs> Friday into Saturday, I think it's supposed to get cold here. So yeah, yeah we we're, had we're snow last thing. week and yeah. then yesterday was 80. So it's supposed to be 80 today. So yeah, yeah. It's that time of year. It's it's fool's fool's summer. <laughs> That's what I think of it as. So let me preface by saying um this is a, a pretty big topic we're gonna take on. Um so I think we'll just kind of like skim them through the surface um, but I, I know we're I don't remember now what we were talking about last time that that spurred the idea of let's talk about um, about this but um, we wanted to talk about how mindfulness can sometimes give us an avenue into it's kind of recognizing boundaries between ourselves and the rest of the world I think and what we have control over what others have control over um, and tapping into you know, like recognizing that and then how do we practice like non-attachment so when I know something's out of my control um, how do I kind of detach from being super invested in the outcome um, so just as a broad overview of, of what we're talking about so if we go back to a basic definition of mindfulness that it's attention to the present moment without judgment um, by definition when we're being mindful we are um, just immersing ourselves in what's here right in front of us right now. Um, and when you think about attachment to outcome, that's almost by definition future oriented, right? So if we're getting attached to what our expectations are about something, um, whether that something is like a product, something we're working on, or that's a relationship or a reaction from another person, um, all those kinds of things are their future. Right, so a real mindful um, a mindfulness kind of uh, perspective would be um, the way I write about this in my book is if you're if you're going to worry, then worry, you know, but do it now in the present tense and give it your attention. Um, and when we worry, um, I, I think worry is our brain planning, trying to predict and control the future. Um, and there's nothing wrong with planning, but be aware that that's what you're doing. When we're worrying and it's like on this back channel because we're also cooking dinner and helping with math facts or whatever we need to be doing, um, none of it gets our full attention. So it's like the opposite of mindfulness. It's kind of like mindlessness because we're dividing our mind um, and dividing our attention over a bunch of tasks. Um, but if I'm going to bring my full attention, you know, to what I'm doing in the present moment without judgment and what I'm deciding is best for me right now is to figure out what my next steps are, you know, so, so called to worry about what's coming next. Um, but if I'm bringing my full attention to it, I'm really planning and prioritizing. It's different than worrying. So worrying is kind of ruminating and having a spiral you know, again, in that back channel of your brain. Um, but if I'm doing it in the, with my full attention being brought to it, I'm planning, I'm prioritizing. Um, and then I think because we're bringing full attention to it, it helps us to notice 
kind of what, what are the limitations to my control? Um, which could be as basic as I can do, you know, I can do this thing and whether people like it or don't like it, I can't control that. Um, but what I do have control over is can I do it in accordance with my value system? You know, whatever this thing is I need to do, maybe it's, we're just talking about how I, how I um, present myself to the world, how I act towards other people. Um, if I'm doing it in, you know, consistently with my value system, at the end of the day, I can walk away saying, you know, maybe I had some tough decisions to make today, but I did the best that I could with them, with the information that I have, and I did them in a way that, you know, is aligned with what's, you know, what's deep in my, my heart, what's best for me as a person, what aligns with how I feel the world should work, how people should treat each other, all that kind of stuff. Um, then at the end of the day, maybe I feel okay about that. The difficult part is, you know, again, I, I can't control and none of you who are listening can control somebody else's reaction to that, right? So that's all, that's the stuff, like the boundary then between us and them is, you know, I control what I do. I control how I respond to others, but I don't control their reaction to me. Um, and I think we talked about this a little bit when we were talking about communication, like somebody else's reaction to me isn't just about me and them. In fact, if they're another adult, it's very little about me and them, unless they know me really well. It's probably more about them and theirs, <laughs> them and their stuff that, that comes in and it creates like this filter that new information comes through. So if they always have negative experiences with people, um, I just, I'll use my own example, like I'm in a helping profession. So if I've got somebody who's had negative experiences with people in a helping profession, their immediate, like, it's like a window screen, right? What's gonna come through that window screen and get here is going to, it's going to filter through, you know, people that are in the helping profession fill in the blank, can't be trusted, are in it for the money, um, don't have my best interest at heart, whatever it is that they're saying to themselves is going to filter whatever I do or say. Um, and I could do, you know, everything as best as I can and in a, in a way where my intention is to help, um, but it's going to get filtered through that and they're going to see that and they might walk away from that experience and be like, I don't like her. She's, you know, she's not going to be helpful to me and it might have absolutely nothing to do with me. Right. So that's kind of where we get to, I think what we're talking about is like, let's, you know, if we can move away from attachment, if we can move away from, I guess it's like validation uh, that what I'm doing is right because of how others are responding to it. That might not be the best barometer. And if we can come back into here and use like our own value system um, as that barometer, that might be more useful. And then our emotions become the signal of that, like how that barometer is calibrated. If something, if I'm doing something that's not in accordance with my value system, it's probably not going to feel really good. I'm going to feel like um, you know, embarrassed or guilty or disappointed in myself or disappointed or embarrassed or ashamed of like the world at large for how things are going. But there's going to be some signal emotionally that, that I'm out of alignment. That's a lot of heavy stuff. <laughs> what reactions, thoughts, what is this bringing up? Um, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm not gonna go into too personal details um, because they're too personal to share. But yes, um, talking about giving more um, weight to somebody's opinion than to your own value system that that kind of that kind of really hit and yeah be able to separate your, yourself um yeah i i got some people in my life that i really care about that that have serious opinions ab about some of my choices mm -hmm. and i i want to include these people in my life um <laughs> i guess i just need to figure out at what point do i make my decision based on my um based on my values and not, and just, and, and perhaps run the risk of ruining a relationship. Yeah, or, or run the risk of, of somebody else not approving of the choice yeah. that you made. Yeah, 
Yeah. And I think that's a real, real common situation, you know, that lots of people go through that. Um, the other piece is obviously none of us can see into each other's hearts necessarily. And, um, and again, we're filtering, like we're interpreting other people's actions based on our past, right? Our, our history, our other relationships that we've had. Um, so, you know, somebody judging like, you know, this choice that you're making is not the choice that I would make and therefore it's wrong. That's informed by not just you, maybe slightly informed by you, but it's also gonna be informed by all this other stuff in their history, all this stuff within them, you know, maybe their own misgivings about choices they've made in the past or their disappointments or their yeah. times and they're confused. So like a lot of stuff gets projected onto that interpretation of, of you and your motives and your, you know, whatever, whatever they're projecting onto you. Um, so, you know, we can practice mindfulness both in kind of checking ourselves when we respond to that and react to that. Um, and also when we're in that situation, you know, this person who's important to me, maybe it's my child, maybe it's, you know, my partner, maybe it's a sibling, um, you know, they made this decision. I don't agree with it. Like I would never do that, you know, and now I'm going to give them a piece of my mind about why they made the wrong decision, you know, maybe that's an opportunity to be really mindful. And rather than like immediately stepping into, you shouldn't have done this because, or I told you so, <laughs> I told you that would go wrong because blah, 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 you should have seen that coming. You know, again, if we can bring ourselves back into like, how, how, how can I be mindfully present, which is a lot more about listening than about responding and, and reacting and judging, you know, and, and, I think this is also where mindfulness moves into, there, there's a whole chunk of literature on mindful self-compassion. So how do we come back into the present moment and show compassion to ourselves? So when we're feeling crummy or sad or scared or all this host of normal human emotions that are uncomfortable, how do we um, as grown adults, like check back in with ourselves and, and kind of nurture ourselves and give ourselves what we need. And I think the better we get at practicing that, the easier it is to give that to others, you know, maybe rather than jumping into judgment because my sibling made this bad financial decision and now they're coming to me asking for money, maybe rather than jumping into, I told you, so you shouldn't have done that, you know, maybe then we can really be compassionate around like, gosh, I can see you're really suffering. You know, I, I know it was hard for you to come to me and ask me for money. Totally different response. Yeah. Yeah. And neither doesn't, of those- doesn't mean you have to, doesn't mean you have to do something that that's against your value system or something you're uncomfortable with, like giving them money. Exactly. But, yeah. Yeah. And that's when like, you know, the action, the behavior that you choose um, does not have to be that. Like we, we can be compassionate with, I mean, it's, you're in a bad situation. I can see that. And it was hard for you to admit that and come to me and, and ask me. And I'm not saying that like in a gloating way, like you could do that in a really gloating way, but you could also do it in a pretty compassionate way. Um, and that also doesn't, again, determine like, what are the next steps? Yeah. Like I'm opening my checkbook or I'm, I'm not, or maybe I'm saying like, I really understand that. And I can see that. And at this time, I'm not somebody who can, you know, can help you with that, but maybe I can find you somebody else who can, like, maybe there's like depending on the circumstance, circumstances, maybe there's like an organization that can support somebody if they're, you know, medical needs or mental health needs or down on the, their luck and just need some support for the next month. Um, not to get too far into that tangent, but right, right. You know, we, can, so, we can do that. And so the, we, the, go ahead. Oh, so we can use mindfulness in how we respond to them. Maybe, maybe we could talk about, um, how how we can specifically use mindfulness when other people aren't being mindful in how they treat us mm -hmm. they're they're judgmental they're very they're they're issuing um ultimatums even you know um how how do we let go use mindfulness to let go of judgment toward us yeah 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 and uh like such a human thing, right? Oh yeah. Um, and I was thinking about this before, well, earlier today, when thinking about what I want to talk about, you know, all of the reason that other people's opinions are important to us, um, it's it's all 
uh, evolutionary, right? So if people um, were really reliant on extended families, like tribal groups, like our social group was super important for survival when we were largely a hunter-gatherer society because we needed that. Like we needed, <laughs> we yes. spent most of our time like getting food, making sure there was enough food, having somebody like watch the babies while other people were, were getting the food. Like we relied on a group. So we're really coded in to not upset the group and to keep the group happy. Um, and, you know, fortunately, most of us are in a position now where we're not as dependent on others for our own survival, but we're still like coded genetically to respond that way to others. So we do put a lot of value on other people's opinions. It's just kind of how people are. Um, conversely, this, this is going to sound kind of strange, but we also, when we do things to kind of keep the pecking order of the group. Like that's, that's another piece of the social structure. Um, but we also tend to isolate, like we tend to self-isolate ourselves when um, we're feeling lesser than, or when we're, when we're struggling and there's it's a whole long like story evolutionarily why we do that. But it's something that's a real common human characteristic that when we're feeling, you know, down, depressed, sad, anxious, whatever, we um, we tend like to for a lot of people to physically isolate, but also um, we talk to ourselves in an isolating way. I'm the only one who ever feels this way. What's wrong with me? Like that's a real, real common thing. That that again makes sense when you think about humans. Um, so when we uh, think about why is it important that other people like us, it's, it's important that other people like us because we're human beings. So we're all going to have that you know, as a piece of, of our makeup. Um, and then we get into, um, you know, what do we do about it? And, and what, um, I got, there's so many different directions I could go in in this. I'm kind of like getting myself lost in my own thoughts with it. I, yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> um, but Megan, the, the, the specific question that you asked was how do we, um, like not get pulled into that when there's, there's judgment of. Yeah. Yeah. Right. How do yeah, we use right. mindfulness to, to just, to just do what we know is right yeah. for us. Yeah. And regardless of the judgment that come from people we really care about. Yeah. yeah. I think a good practice that can inform this is mindfulness of emotions. So really recognizing what our emotional states are when they're coming up. Um, because again, I, I, the way I conceptualize emotion is um, strong emotion becomes a signal of alignment with your values. So strong positive emotion is typically things are agreeing with my value system. My kids graduating from high school, I feel proud, I feel um, content. I, you know, I feel excited about the future. That would all be true if I have a strong value of education, right? Like, and probably yes. reflects back on, um, if I have a, some values around how I raise my children and they've, you know, hit these milestones that are in my head important. Conversely, um, situations where you have a strong negative emotion, things like guilt, embarrassment, shame, um, disappointment, fear, those are often, either internally, like I'm doing something myself that goes against my value system. Um, so like a, a guilt one, you know, I go to the store and rather than paying for something, I slip it in my pocket and I walk outside and then I'm haunted by guilt um, for the rest of the day, which, you know, is pretty far out of my behavior. So I can, <laughs> I can kind of laugh about that. Um, but, you know, if I had a belief that you shouldn't take from others, um, and then I did that, I would feel guilty about it. I would probably also feel embarrassed about it. Um, it's almost embarrassing even just to make that up to the story because I'm a grown adult who, you know, has, I don't steal things. So, right. um, you know, uh, shame is often, so guilt is often, I did something bad. Shame like takes it a step farther to I am bad, like more than my behavior is bad, but there's something deeply like within me that is bad and, and you know, not forgiven or not forgivable. Um, so, you know, when we have those strong emotions, um, you know, they're telling us something. And if we can tune, if we can use mindfulness to like, rather than because they're uncomfortable, like what I have to do to get rid of this. Um, maybe we sit with it 
and really, you know, tune into, okay, what's going on? Why is that coming up for me? You know, what was the thing that was happening before I felt this way? What was I even like, what was happening internally? What was I thinking about? What was I experiencing? Um, and really just bring our attention and understand that kind of get really quiet so that we can hear whatever it is that our our body is trying to tell us um you know and again everybody's different like if religious pieces speak to you like for some people that's like getting quiet enough to listen to you know to your soul or to listen you know to meditate to hear god talking back to you all that kind of stuff um and if you're not religious and you keep it at a more secular level, like we, I could sit here and give you an explanation for, for why this all happens evolutionarily. Like it keeps our species safe. If we, um, as a social species, if we do things that are gonna, you know, uh, preserve the values of the group essentially. So, so all that kind of stuff stands. So if we can be present to those emotions and sit with them, um, we can glean that information from them. Um, and I think sometimes then like when we, we can, we can be less reactive to others and more responsive. So if I've made a choice and I'm hearing from somebody, you know, that's wrong, you shouldn't do it that way. And I know in my heart um, that that's the right choice for me and that that aligns well with my value system. You know, maybe I can, I can be mindful of me and my needs and, and my choices and my decisions. And I can also respond responsibly to them. Like I don't have to defend because I'm comfortable. I'm safe in this, in the skin and in these choices I made. And I can, you know, say like, I can hear that this is a really important issue to you and you have really strong feelings about that. Um, and thank you for trusting me enough to share those feelings with me. Um, period. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> and maybe that's it. Maybe that's all it is because maybe it doesn't matter. You know, maybe that person doesn't get to weigh in on the decisions that you make. Um, or depending on the relationship, maybe rather than period, it's comma, you know, comma. And I've really put a lot of time and thought into this. And this is the choice that's right for me right now. You know? I just about wrote those down word for word. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 But again, like it's that responsive versus reactive. There's a lot, there's a lot of power there. So reactive is like, my emotions are coming up and I'm like trying to make things better, like on the fly is what that feels like to me. You know, you're telling me this and I'm like firing, like shots fired back kind of thing. Whereas responsive is much more like I can see you and I can hear you in this moment. And that doesn't, again, just like with the giving money to the sibling who's down on their luck or whatever, that doesn't necessarily mean I'm opening my wallet and writing you a check for 10 grand. It's, like I can hear you, I can empathize, I can be compassionate, um, I can commiserate, I can try and talk you through and problem solve it, but I'm not necessarily gonna change, like I'm not necessarily gonna make a choice that goes against my value system in that moment. Yeah, okay, I like that. All right, anybody else have any questions at this point? Any comments you wanna make? Um, anybody wanna share uh, a situation? I, I, I mean, I told you I wasn't going to go too deep into mine, but I just kind of skimmed the surface. So it is a very deep subject. I will say that it's, and it, it takes a lot of practice. Um, yeah. I, say, I not... really love the mindful self-compassion literature. Like if you're interested in this, I would, I would look into Kristen Neff. It's N-E-F-F. Like look into some of her work. Um, I recently did a course on mindful self-compassion that, that I really liked and got a lot from, um, but just like uh, she has like a, this is kind of taken from her work, um, the system of like when you're having uh, a strong emotion, um, name it, find it in your body. And that might be opposite. Like you might not be fast to name, like what am I feeling? Like maybe you need to first tune into where is this in my body and what is it somatically? Is my heart racing? Is my stomach feeling like it's twisted in a knot? Mm -hmm. um, you know, is my face feeling flushed? You know, where where do I experience this? And the mindfulness piece gets us out of the judgment. So it's it's just an experience in our body. This is a bad thing. I shouldn't be feeling this. That's a judgment, uh, and that's probably not going to be helpful because the reality is you are feeling it. That's right. <laughs> you're feeling it. You're feeling it. And if you can trust that your that our emotions 
provide information and that they come up for a reason, like then we can glean data, frankly, from that. Um, we can be a little bit, not like in a cold detached way, but like we, again, we can respond to it as opposed to reacting to it. Like I don't have to stuff it down because it's uncomfortable, but I can connect with it. I can listen to it. So if I name it, I feel it. And then the next part um, they talk about is um, soften towards it. Like give it the space that it needs, be compassionate towards it. You know, our bodies are really not designed for the way the world is right now. Right? No. So okay. can, can I give some compassion, even like just compassion to my nervous system? You know, heart, you're beating like 20 million miles an hour because you're worried about life and death. And actually I'm looking at my bank account <laughs> and I'm worrying about like, how am I going to pay this bill? I don't need to worry about life and death. That's not going to kill me right now. Um, so... I, I, I think that we are so, um, most of us are just so geared to trying to be tough, trying to, trying to get everything done, trying to be, you know, super parent, super worker, whatever that, that we forget sometimes that, that we're human and that, and that we've got to be compassionate with ourselves. Um, I think I mentioned my sister having this, this little bit of a struggle and, um, this is new to her. Um, she's always been my sounding board and I've had, I've had some, some interesting trials in my life. And she, when she came to me, she came to me because she knew number one, I'd understand. And number two, that I, I love her unconditionally, which is true. Um, but I keep reminding her you you're, you're struggling. It's okay that you are not yourself. And, and it's that self-compassion, the mindful self-compassion give yourself a break. You've had a rough go of things. It's okay to feel the way you're feeling and it will take some time. You'll come back, but don't, don't be too hard on yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And and that's almost word for word. Like what they talk about in mindful self-compassion is recognizing that you're struggling, recognizing that it's a normal human experience to struggle. So I'm struggling. Or maybe it's, I'm feeling sad, or I'm feeling disappointed, or I'm feeling embarrassed. It's normal to have that feeling, um, which counters. So the first piece is mindfulness, right? Here's what I'm experiencing. I am struggling. The second piece is connecting with our common humanity, which fights that isolation tendency. It's normal for people to struggle from time to time, to feel disappointment, to feel embarrassment or guilt or whatever you're experiencing. Um, and then kind of saying, may I be kind to myself? May I practice compassion towards myself? Even asking, what do I need right now? Or what would I tell a friend right now? We probably like either beat ourselves up. I mean, I, it's not probably, I know we do this. We beat ourselves up in ways that we would never talk to a friend, right? If a friend was, even if we're thinking like maybe they made a choice, most of us wouldn't remind a friend, like you made a crappy choice and now you're <laughs> dealing with it, right? We would say, oh, well, <laughs> maybe we would, put yourself. <laughs> some people probably would, I'm sure. But you know, if this yeah. is something that you really care about. Yeah, depending gonna... on your relationship and who it is and what, what's happened. Right. Yeah, you, I think all of us have that friend or that uh, family member who'll say, well, you know, you brought this on yourself. I love you, I'll help you, but you still, <laughs> it's just your fault. Right. Yeah. But you know, if, if, if you would help a friend by saying like, you know, if you knew your friend was saying, you know, you're a stupid idiot, I can't believe you did this, your life's a mess now, like you're just worthless, you're never gonna be able to recover from this, we would probably say, of course that's not true. Like there's yeah. very few things that, you know, we can't recover from. Um, and, you know, it, I believe anyways, a, a bad choice does not mean you're a stupid, worthless individual that never should have been born, right? So, right. But we will say that to ourselves. Yes, we will. So and that's like, don't talk helpful. to yourself. Right, exactly. So recognize that, that that's that tendency, again, to like isolate ourselves from the tribe. And no, we're just, we're just a part of it. We're just like everybody else. We're no worse, we're no better in most situations. But um, if you're talking to yourself that way, that's, that's probably not going to be real helpful. So, you know, maybe the way you talk to yourself is like, I can see that you're really suffering right now um, and that you're feeling like there's not a way through it. And what I would tell a friend is there's, there's always going to be a way through it and that I'll help you. 
and, and this is going to start to sound like woo-woo psychologist right? But some of that, like, I'll help you, I think is like, it's ourselves talking to our younger versions of ourselves because it's that younger version of ourself that feels powerless. You know, it's that child part that was powerless in a lot of situations that gets activated when we're feeling that way. You know, so to come back in as here's my grown up adult woman self saying, okay, like I can feel sad, I can feel disappointed, and I can gather the resources, I have the skills, I have the voice, I, you know, I can do the things I need to do to advocate for myself and to circle the wagons and get the support that I need. Yeah. Yep. That's awesome. I like that. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Um, I know that uh, Dr. Dwyer and I have been going back and forth quite a bit. Anybody else want to chime in? I've gotten lots of good notes taken, so. <laughs> <clears throat> Nobody has any questions on how to deal with those, those uh, thoughts that come into our heads and sometimes just how to, how to, how to mindfully deal with it. Everybody's quiet today. <clears throat> they all know that I'm the one that really needs help in this area. <laughs> I think it's just a lot of practice too. And, and there's, there's some shifts that I, I, I have experienced as I practice mindfulness longer. And one of them is, and I'm not, I am not hundred <laughs> percent with this. It's like a work in progress. Um, but starting to recognize strong negative emotions as data points, as opposed to treating them as reality. Um, and what I mean by that is like, if I'm, um, you know, having a really strong reaction to something, like it's again, stepping back a little bit and being able to say like, wow, that's interesting. <laughs> Wonder why that's coming up for me right now, as opposed to just like, this is really negative and whoop, I'm glued to it. I'm going wherever it takes me, like stepping back and questioning it a little bit. Um, because those are like the points where like, then we can, we can kind of do like a course correction if we need to. Yeah. Um, yeah. They don't become who we are. They're just like you said, just kind of little, um, like, uh, guardrails almost. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I like that. So shifting your, your, it's almost like your expectations or your, um, shifting your response to strong emotions from like, you know, immediate attachment to it, at, to, um, kind of curiosity and moving into like a little bit of, of an observer stance. Like, can I, can I step back and ask why this is coming up? Um, again, that, you know, can I find, can I name the feeling? Can I find it in my body? Can I soften towards it? Can I give myself some soothing around it? Can I allow that feeling just to be there? Um, can I actually like move into that feeling, like direct my attention into it as opposed to distracting away from it or taking action to try and make it stop? And if I bring my attention into that feeling, what happens? Does it change? Does it move in my body? Does it shift? Does it um, give me information? Does it start to go away because I've paid attention to it? Um, all just like, not ways at least that I was ever taught certainly not as a child, <laughs> um, how to manage emotions. It's kind of like, oh, yeah. if you feel sad, let's do something to make you feel happy. Um, whereas, you know, I think that's a positive thing for kids to learn. Like sometimes you feel sad and that's okay. And it's temporary and you'll feel better over time. Or your friends didn't involve you in something, involve you in something that they're doing. That's fun. I can certainly understand why you feel sad. Well, again, then how do we bring some compassion? Like it really hurts when your friends leave you out. And as an adult, we can all say we've all had times when we felt left out, <laughs> like oh yeah, totally common thing. You know, it's it's really it is different for kids because they may be experiencing it for the first time in their life, and they don't have the perspective. You know, that time gives you that you know you know you'll get through it and come out on the other side of it. But then that's our job as the adults, right? Is to be because they don't have that internalized yet. We can be that compassion of gosh, it really hurts when your friends leave you out or they don't save space for you at the lunch table and then you're, you feel all alone. You know, I've had that happen to me. That's it, not fun at all. Yeah. And, you know, I'm really sorry that you felt that way. And I know you have a lot 
of good things to offer and a lot of people would love to be your friend you know and and I guess that's the piece that like when we as adults get sucked into that spiral like when I talk about that younger part of ourselves that gets activated like that's the part (laughs) <laughs> that's the part that maybe had like some unmet need at some other point in time where we were feeling totally alone and, you know, and whatever, either we didn't, maybe somebody stepped in and we didn't recognize that they were stepping in to help us, or maybe nobody stepped in and helped us. And we were kind of struggling it, struggling with it on our own. And that gets activated when we're in a similar situation as an adult. And, and that self, that self-compassion can just validate that version of our younger self. And sometimes, sometimes that's all you need is just validation. Not always, but definitely sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. And I also like what you said about, about paying attention to what's going on and seeing what happens to it when you pay attention to it instead of stuffing it down. Um, yeah. Cause stuffing, stuffing things is never, doesn't seem to end well <laughs> for any of us. Yeah. It's like if you do yoga, I've had a lot of yoga teachers say, you know, you get into a certain posture and like find the spots that feel uncomfortable and then just let, send your breath there. Like let your attention Mm -hmm. rest in those thoughts and what happens over time. Yeah. Like it goes away. Like you get, you get used to it. You get used to the posture or you, you know, the muscles stretch the right way or what started off as like a difficult stretch as the muscle loosens becomes, you know, not yeah. difficult anymore, uh, right? One one of the classes, one of the yoga t- classes I take, we use a lot of therapy. They're, they're therapy balls, um, just mm-hmm. rubber balls, and you know we'll put them on a, a, you know, like working on I don't know, let's say, uh, um, okay, this is a bad area for people, but your glutes, you know, um, and you put some lean on, lean against a wall, or sit on it in a certain way, and and if you find a spot that's really really bad you just kind of back off and breathe and kind of work around it and yes eventually um yeah you you find that uh, that does using the breath using um the the movement and a little bit of pressure not too much um yeah. can help relieve some of that stress and then not only does that spot feel better but it 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 radiates i remember taking um one class one day and we worked on a spot on our backs and for three days, three days, I felt awesome. So yeah, something to be said for that. So lots of metaphors here. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh. you know, and something else that you just said too, like noticing, like we talk about this a lot in yoga is, um, yeah, you might be uncomfortable, but you shouldn't be in pain, right? Right. We, and, we call it to the point of sensation, not yes. pain. Yeah. And we can do that too. Like we, when we're digging into this stuff and like noticing our feelings, I think we have to be aware of that. Like, is it helpful? And am I uncomfortable, but not like in dire pain when I tune into this emotion? if I'm past the point and it's like really, really like truly painful, um, you know, then maybe I do need to back off or maybe rather than trying to do it on my own, I get some support, you know, whether that's, you know, a helping professional or very trusted, you know, friend or family member who can hold that space for you. Um, you know, somebody to remind you that you're definitely not in it alone, um, is important, but like we kind of have to be I'm thinking like a regulator valve on a pressure cooker, right? Like, mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> keep it like in the zone where, um, in reading, we talk about the zone of proximal development. So I've, I've done a lot of work with literacy and dyslexia in my past. Um, when you're teaching somebody to read, you want them to be challenged, but not so challenged that they give up completely, right? Absolutely. And it's the same with our emotions, right? Like deal okay. with them, it might be challenging, but if it's so challenging that you're checking out completely, you know, you're you know, drinking yourself into oblivion or you're um, you know, doing something else to distract or check out um, or you're you know, really going in an unhealthy way because the emotions are so, so much, that's not, that's not useful anymore. And it could potentially be harmful. Um, if it's, you know, uncomfortable, but you're, man, you're able to manage it, then there might be good information there. I, I like that. I like that. I can definitely relate to all this. Um, yeah. The, 
the way we've talked about today hits home for me. So I hope, I hope it does for everybody else that's uh, listening and are, are watching the replay later. Um, but, uh, yes. Okay. Um, anything else, Kim, that you wanted to, to touch on? Anybody have any questions at this point? We're not afraid of silence. <laughs> Well, this has all been very good information. Yeah. Yeah. And te teach it to your kids. Yeah. Teach them to not bury things. Teach them just take a step back and analyze what's going on a little bit. Um, yeah. And we can model it, you know, because yes. everybody knows this stuff goes on when you're dealing with parenting situations and we can model, you know, saying to our kids, you know what? mom misspoke because I'm feeling frustrated, which is my signal that I need to take care of myself for a few minutes. I'm going to go for a walk or I'm going to go wash my face or whatever. And then I'm going to come back and we can talk about this some more later. Um, you know, do it together. Like, sit, like, let's just, I've got to sit and breathe right now. And if I sit and breathe and calm myself, I know I'll be able to talk to you and we'll be able to work this problem out. Do you want to come sit with me? We can do it together. And they might not, especially if they're, you know, older kids and they want their own space, but like we, you know, we can model that in the moment. Um, and when we're doing that, you know, we're, we're teaching that skill to them. I like that. Invite them to do it with you. Cool. I have a question. Sure. Um, so we have some kids that are pretty highly reactive <laughs> and thinking about all of this, how do you help them feel like they've been able to fully explore those emotions and those feelings while still calming them down and stopping them? Does that make sense? I, I'm afraid that sometimes that turns into a, oh, it's not okay to feel this feeling when right. you have to stop them because it's turning physical and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think we might've talked about, we talked about this at some point. I think I, I shared the, um, the elevator example. Um, but if you talk to them about like helping them to start to kind of apply a metric to how big they're feeling and their, their, their output of the feeling is. Um, so I like the elevator, like the 10 floor building. Um, if we, you know, if we're on the ground floor, we're calm, cool as a cucumber. And, you know, then we start to get, as we go up, we're more and more activated. And for most people, we did talk about this, didn't we? Am I thinking about, does it ring any bells to anybody? Yeah, <laughs> I think we talked about this. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, you know, if we get to like the seventh floor, like maybe that's like the danger zone where, you know, I'm explosive and, um, not able to hear anymore. Um, if, you know, if you can get kids who can talk about that and start to modulate, um, that can be really useful of what, what are the things that are useful if I'm on the seventh floor versus, you know, what can I do if I'm on the third floor? Um, and I've used the language, um, a lot with kids, like, feelings aren't good or bad. It's what you do with them. That's helpful or not helpful. Um, and if, you know, if the feeling has gotten so big that we're physically exploding and, and potentially harming others, um, it's probably not helpful anymore. It's not helping you, the individual, and it's not helping the people around you. And in fact, it's creating potentially new problems if you're, you know, acting in an explosive way. Um, so kind of the recognition of like, we don't have to get rid of the feeling. If the original feeling is I'm angry because my sister got this thing and I didn't get any, um, let's deal with that, but let's get you calm enough that we can talk about it before we deal with it. Because when you're in like the exploding zone, I have one book that, that talks about, um, when kids are at that point, they're, their EEG patterns are more similar to somebody having a seizure than they are to somebody who's, you know, able to calmly discuss something. So let's get you back and regulated and then we can talk about it. Um, so yeah, I think I, I would, I would use that, you know, that there's nothing wrong with feeling angry. There's nothing wrong with feeling sad. Let's get you to, to a point. Let's, let's try and give your body what it needs so that we can talk about it. Um, and then, you know, then we'll talk about it. And a lot of times angry is like, angry is giving power to feelings that feel really powerless. So, you know, angry, angry is sometimes a smoke screen for things like sad, <laughs> um, or scared, you know, or, or something else that, that feels, you know, feels like it has less of a voice, but angry is like a, 
it's like an energized um, emotion that's a little bit easier to express. Does that answer your question? Yeah, and that was perfect. Also, a little follow up question on that too. Sure. So when your kids start to express that, you know, hey, I was angry, but then it comes out that it, they were really just nervous about something coming up or anxious. How do you have any resources that you'd recommend going to to help? Like, okay, now what? You know, I know what they're feeling, but how do I help them deal with it? Does that make sense? Do you know of any good resources to reach out to for that? Yeah. Um, hmm, let me think. If you're really wanting more like nuts and bolts, like what do I do with something like anxiety? Um, a really good one, and it's a little bit geared more towards anxiety disorders, but I still think you can apply it across the board. Um, it's the book is called Freeing Your Child from Anxiety by Tamar Chansky. It's C-H-A-N-S-K-Y. Um, and again, it is geared a little bit more towards anxiety disorders, but there's a lot in there um, about, you know, how, how, like, how do you reframe thoughts? How do you explain to kids, like, you know, anxiety is your body trying to keep you safe. Um, and, you know, and as your parent, I'm also keeping you safe. So like, maybe we can move, we can let go of some of that, that you are safe. So let's talk about, you know, how do we meet your needs, you know, for whatever's coming up, um, right now. Yeah. I'm trying to think of others for other, I mean, a, a lot of it, there's different resources that are kind of based on the uncomfortable emotion. Um, so, you know, like there's lots of great resources for grief with kids. Um, I can't rattle those off off the top of my head right now, but, you know, uh, actually somebody who's often a great ally is a children's librarian. They um, usually have all those books like at their fingertips. Um, and depending on the age of the child, you can get really great picture books. Um, about, you know, emotions in general um, and, you know, guidance for parents on, on how to parent around different uncomfortable emotions. So, no. I just muted myself for a minute. Yeah. I want to hear my computer noises. <clears throat> um, Catherine, did you have any more questions? Thanks for sharing. Be willing to share those with us. They're perfect. Thank you so much. Okay. All right. Kim, thank you so much. The last four weeks have been awesome. I love this topic and I appreciate that you've been willing to share your expertise and your knowledge with us. So sure, you're welcome. Yeah. Thanks for having me. And yeah, I'll just leave it with like, just keep practicing this. It's that maybe the Dalai Lama, some other people are perfect at it. Like I know I am a work in progress and it's easy. It's a lot easier for me to sit and talk about how to do it than to actually do it when I'm on the fly with motions. So it's part of what like my mindful Mondays book is, is all about like, what are the day-to-day -day ways that we can apply right. this and just get easier at practicing them. So yeah. it's all about building kind of practicing to, so that muscle memory is exactly. it, it, so you don't fly off the handle, but you think I've, I've trained for this. <laughs> exactly. Right. Exactly. Okay. Thank you. If, um, if no one else has any questions, then we'll go ahead and end our recording and I will get um, the, uh, replay up um, later today. So thank you again for attending. Next week, we're going to be talking about the Summer Passport Program. So you're going to want to be here um, to catch the latest on that next Monday at noon. We'll see you then. Thank you. Okay, bye, everyone. Bye-bye.